So what I'm doing here, guys, is I'm cupping through some coffees that we're considering right now from Costa Rica. Uh, I've got three coffees on the table. We've already gone through round one and sort of selected uh, this guy right here from Royal Coffee New York. And I've got two additional uh, coffees on the table from Costa Rica, a honey processed coffee, and then a washed pea berry, actually. And the pea berry is sort of a um, uh, deformity of the bean. And, and instead of getting two nicely formed uh, beans inside your cherry, you're getting one uh, deformed bean called a pea berry. Uh, and uh, we don't typically buy pea berries, but for this, uh, we went ahead and we asked for a sample of it just to just to see what it tastes like. And I think that's really important to note that when you're cupping coffee and or sampling coffee, uh, if you're a, a customer of ours, let's say, uh, that you try a lot of different options and really see what's out there because you really never know what you're missing unless you go ahead and try it. So we chose to get a pea berry here. We've got this honey processed and honey processed uh, coffees are um, what they call like a washed or a pulped natural uh, essentially, you are uh, removing the, the fruit from the seeds, leaving the mucilage on the seeds, and then drying it, um, and then going ahead and uh, processing that coffee a little bit further uh, to get it to us here. And that kind of imparts a bit more of a sweetness, uh, obviously a little bit of a fruity note from that mucilage that's been dried on the, on the coffee. Uh, we typically focus on the washed coffees, as we've mentioned in the past, um, but it's always nice, again, to try different ones and see what's out there. Um, one of the important things I wanted to mention is that today we're actually doing a really great interview with a guy named Edwin uh, Martinez from Onyx Coffee. Uh, Edwin uh, started Onyx. Uh, they represent a lot of really great farmers from Guatemala, and we've chose to bring on for the second uh, crop cycle in a row. Uh, his uh, coffee from El Regalito, which is a wonderful family farm, and we'll show you some more information about them uh, in this video. But uh, right now, what we're going to do is we're going to knock over to um, a video interview that we're going to do, because Edwin's on the West Coast, and uh, we're going to get into sort of how Edwin got into the business, uh, his family background in coffee, uh, El Regalito specifically, and then just a bunch of other information about green coffee sourcing and the like. So please stick around for this video. It's gonna be a lot of fun. And thank you again. Um, if you wouldn't mind, we'd appreciate your support by smashing that like button and subscribing to our channel to get updates as we continue to build out the channel itself. So thanks again, guys. And without further ado, here is our interview with Edwin from Onyx Coffee. Edwin, thank you so much for visiting us here at PATH and um, you know, it's awesome. We have your coffee uh, right now, El Regalito, and we had it last season. So uh, we obviously enjoy it so much um, and our customers love it. So um, can you fill us in a little bit about your background and um, how Onyx started and your family and, uh, history and coffee and things like that? Sure, absolutely. Thank you, Jason, for having me as well as for hosting me uh, in, in person pre-COVID. Uh, last fall it was that I was yep. able to come and, and visit you uh, in your offices and roastery and learn more about uh, your, your rich heritage as well. I think you absolutely need to continue to share more and more of, but uh, our, our background, uh, so my, my grandparents uh, bought a farm in 1957 in Northwest Guatemala in the department of Huehuetenango, which is a department is like a state in the United States or a province in Canada. And, and Huehuetenango is, is, is probably the most challenging coffee growing region to get to. It's the most remote. Um, and uh, it's where my father grew up with his siblings. And uh, so they continued with, with the farm, Finca Vista Hermosa. And uh, how I got to where we are now is I ended up uh, wanting simply to get coffee from our farm directly to the roaster's hands. And I had a lot of questions. And so part of my story and journey is just trying to um, connect those dots. And uh, I went to a lot of trade shows and I've uh, been going to SCA uh, for over 20 years. Too bad we and, didn't get there this year. Yeah, it's been, it's been a, a lot of learning. Um, and once we brought our coffee up the first year, um, we found that we had a lot of neighbors brought samples to us. 
um, and they wanted us to to take some of their coffee as well. And we had roasters that uh, wanted wanted coffee, and um, the first year went terrible. Uh, I, I really was not able to sell any of our coffee for almost a full year. Um, and so fortunately, I only brought up about a third of our harvest, um, but it was a big learning curve and uh, had a lot of great feedback. And, well, the, the learning curve was understanding how a lot of people buy coffee. I brought it up and people said they loved it. Um, and I thought, great. Uh, how much do you want? I'm like, oh, we, we actually, we don't need any right now, but we love your coffee. Um, and and so I really just needed to start, you know, it's a sales cycle that uh, I, I, I was going from, you know, a seven year cycle of, of planting a seed to seeing a mature fruit to thinking, okay, someone goes to a shop and buys a cup of coffee. That's, that's a pretty instant cycle and the coffee shops are restocking their, their roasted coffee and their milk and other products, you know, on a weekly, monthly, bi-weekly, uh, some sort of cadence that's, you know, it's a big gap between seven years and, and weekly. And so I just didn't know what the purchasing of green looked like for, for roasters. And so the second year we, we sold out and then we brought up double and, and that kept happening. And that's really how Onyx was born. Uh, we began invoicing for our neighbor's coffee, a uh, different farm name. Um, to, to a roaster, but uh, my company that I started initially in the United States uh, was called the same name as our farm, Finca Vista Hermosa. So that's really how, how it started, just connecting neighbors, other producers to, to roasters and uh, seeing that people were producing some really exceptional quality, but that cost was getting lost in the marketplace, just like ours was, um, and that there were people that really wanted that quality um, and and we're, it wasn't accessible. So being able to connect the dots and provide access. And, uh, and, and that's how Onyx was born. As, as we were invoicing people from Finca Vista Hermosa, it made sense to have a name that wasn't our farm if we're selling coffee that was not from our farm. Sure. Um, and so I, I, um, I had Ideas and we didn't end up going fortunately with, with any of them. And my wife picked the name Onyx because uh, she, name. she said, we should have a name that no one else has. And, uh, you know, of course, with any name you pick, uh, you know, you're going to find half a dozen other path coffee companies if you haven't come across them already. Um, but um, we, we embraced it. And really the culture of the company has uh, evolved. And we've come to a point now where um, we've, we've grown a lot, but we're really refocusing on building um, these initial connections where the company started and, and really asking more questions to see how we can support producers long-term as well as roasters and try and create good long-term sustainable relationships where everyone comes out ahead. Yeah, it's become uh, more challenging in some ways, but I think anytime you're tested and you go through something difficult, you uh, you either don't survive or you survive and you come out stronger. Yeah, sure. And so it's it's not new for farmers. Um, this this is a you know a, this pandemic and crisis is on many levels with with obviously health and the economy, but uh, the idea of a crisis is not new for most producers. Um, so this is just another level. Um, and uh, and resilience is, I would say, in the blood of any farmer, probably not just coffee. I'm sure that's something that most farmers can probably identify with one way or another. Yeah. So how many uh, farmers are you guys working with right now? We're working with about 60. Um, I'd say we've got 40 that are very consistent. Um, some of them are very small, uh, producing uh, a, you know, a pallet or two, 10, 20 bags mm -hmm. um, or less. And, um, and then some of them are, are producing multiple containers. Um, and typically, if, if it's a very small producer, um, we, we're able to, to take some of the risk, take a little bit more of the risk. But as, they, as they're a larger producer, we need to mitigate that risk and either have contracts that go all the way through, or we, uh, we want to encourage them to make the, the best decisions uh, for their short and long term. So if 
if we can be a part of that, we certainly want to lean in and, and be helpful as much as we can, but we also don't want to be uh, a burden that introduces risk. So as, as we work with larger farms, we, we're often, even if we could sell it all, we try and encourage them to really consider what, you know, what's the best decision for them uh, short term and long term and the level at which we partner with them can vary where they're at and where, where what they need and where they want to go. So what, what um, sort of attracts you to a farm, uh, let's say like El Regalito that we have uh, on the menu right now, and uh, how do you work with them as you progress with the relationship to increase quality or, or what have you? Yeah, that's a great question. So that's, it's, that's a really good example of how we've grown organically because when we have, um, when we have a, a, a roaster that visits and, and I really don't know what next year is going to look like, but uh, we, we typically host about 100 roasters um, a year. And I've been doing that for over a decade. And so 13 years ago, I uh, really, from the very beginning, I started bringing a lot of people down to Guatemala uh, by myself. And so now over a decade later, we're not really hosting that many more roasters, um, but we've grown a lot. We've grown those relationships. So, so through that, um, we, we have farmers that will bring samples when we're visiting a producer that we're already working with. And, and we don't even solicit the samples, but they'll bring samples to us uh, because they know the people in the community. And, uh, and they see, oh, our neighbor here has a really good relationship with, with uh, a consistent buyer and they're getting good price and they're, and they're actually investing more in the land that cost them more. So they must be getting a, a, a better price because it's justifying that added investment. Mm -hmm. And that, that's what allows them to get that quality. So I think when people see the benefits of that, that mutual investment uh, relationally, um, they're curious. And uh, even, even if someone's looking just at the very short term, people want to sell the product at the best price possible. So even if it's at, at the simplest uh, love, it's a very common thing for, for a farmer to bring samples to anyone that might consider buying it. So that's how Arturo and his son Vilma. Vilma actually spent uh, uh, some of his life in Los Angeles and came back. And so it's a, a really interesting story of, of really coming back to invest in the family, in the land, in the community. Um, and and this, this is just another case where, where we actually got uh, I, I don't even know how we got this initially, uh, but we've actually grown quite a bit with them because they have a lot of neighbors that bring coffee. So we collectively uh, actually work with them to buy more coffee from, from their community. Uh, and that's something that, that we do a lot. We don't grow that very quickly with anyone. Um, that has to happen in a very um, paced manner. Um, and so we earn each other's trust uh, slowly over time. And, uh, so as we do that, um, we're able to get to know what what are the things that are challenging for them, um, and what are what are the things that are in alignment long term for all of us, so that we can ensure that we're making investments in places that aren't, aren't just going to be a good short term return for the producer or for a roaster or for us, but that really makes sense for everyone long term. And if it makes a lot of sense in the short term, but we don't see long term alignment. Um, you ask the question, how do we decide like who to work with? Um, that that will rule out uh, who not to work with, and so it's almost more of an effort to to try and to try and pull away uh, who who is not a good fit. And there's a lot of producers that have amazing coffees that um, that end up not being a good fit for us to invest with because um, you know, either they have a higher risk tolerance, um, and so they'll be on on and off with us. Um, and uh, they, uh, they may be looking for the highest price and, and they may get the highest price if they have a really great coffee. Um, but the, those are the same farmers that if they don't have continuity and relationship, uh, there are some years, and I see it happen all the time, where someone has an amazing coffee and they've been holding out for a really good price for their coffee, but they kind of missed a window and then they're sitting on it. Yep. Um, and doesn't get better that's, with age. That's, that's sad. It doesn't. It doesn't, and that's true. It doesn't matter where the coffee is at on the farm, in a warehouse, uh, you know, in the producing country, at the roastery. Yeah. yeah. 
So how do you ensure uh, quality and consistency? Uh, obviously, you've been working with El Regalito, um, the, that family, for quite some time. So how do you ensure the consistency is kind of up to Onyx standard and that your customers, like myself, um, are going to be able to buy that coffee um, every season, every, every harvest? So we've got, um, so we're a team of 11, and of us are in the United States and half in Guatemala. Um, I'm actually in Washington State right now, where I live with my wife and kids. And uh, during harvest, I'm in Guatemala for a lot of that time. Depends on where we're at, just the stage in life. Uh, sometimes I might go back and forth a few times a month, or I might stay for longer periods. Um, but the way we manage our QC is by spending time with producers throughout the year. Um, so we're visiting, we're connecting them with any resource that we have available, obviously offering what, what we can internally, um, but connecting them with technicians from Ana Cafe, which is the Guatemalan Producers uh, Coffee Association. Um, we'll connect them with, with other agronomists. Um, and many times we're able to just introduce other producers that we're working with uh, who maybe are agronomists and they've um, They've invested a lot and maybe been able to take some bigger risks and maybe had some failures and that they've been able to learn from and share. Um, and so we end up getting samples uh, pretty early on. And anyone that we work with, we, we start small. Uh, we, we don't take a, a big bite anywhere out of the get-go. We, we, we start pretty small with anyone we work with. Um, and then in any given crop year, we'll get samples right off the patio as we're visiting. And so that often happens when, if you were to come down, um, it I feels so. very so casual, spontaneous, but you're with me and we'll physically just grab some right off the patio and put it in a bag. Um, and then someone on our team will track it and it'll make its way back to our lab. Do you have a little mill to husk the, uh, the, the beans that have been drying on the patio or how does that get, how does that get milled? For yeah. your sampling. Yeah. We don't do it right on the spot, but we'll, we'll take it back to our lab. And, uh, and Julio and Oscar, our team, are both responsible for, for hosting. Um, so they plan and they manage all of our hosting, everything from picking people up to, at the airport to if, if people want helping coordinate where to stay um, and managing transportation and planning visits and cuppings. Um, and we can do that, you know, every step of the way from start to finish for a week visit, or it can be a, a three hour engagement where maybe you're only in Guatemala for a few days or even just a day. Um, and, uh, and you can come and cup in our labs in Guatemala city. So we have the coffee samples that will come down centralized in one space. Um, and so we do uh, remove the parchment with the mini dry mill that we have in the lab. Um, we just do a full analysis that would take place at a large dry mill in our lab. And, and that's on the parchment and the green, and then of course going through to, to roasting and cupping. Um, and then we'll track that exact same sample as it moves from the patio to where it's stored on the farm. We'll get another sample at least a few times for each pick. And then we'll also get samples as it goes into a, a warehouse for, for consolidation. If it's moved in a truck uh, from there to a mill, we'll pull a sample again when it's unloaded. And that's just to ensure, um, really just to ensure traceability and transparency with, with the product at, at each step. So every time it moves, we're pulling a sample of the same coffee, even though we know what it is, um, we wanna evaluate if there's been any change uh, over time and transit, uh, looking at things like like humidity, measuring water activity. Um, so by the time we mill the coffee and select the bag marks, um, at that point, we've cupped the coffee oftentimes between four and eight times uh, before we've exported the coffee and, uh, or before we've even milled it. So after we mill it, we'll end up cupping it uh, at least one more time. And that's a final uh, approval after the mill. And it's more evaluating the quality of the milling and seeing what the outcome's like. You have some coffees where some botanical varieties, you've got ripeness happening more at a certain screen size. And so we can have some changes in the cup profile after, after milling. Um, 
if we change the specs. So part of the lab work is anticipating that. And so we, we have screens, we can select and pick uh, you know, exactly what our desired outcome is based on the customer or based on the coffee itself uh, or based on our, our planned profile for that coffee. Um, so, so with the community lot, for example, um, we, we really want to have great consistency. Uh, we've done a lot of work to get something that's a really high quality that's been picked right. Um, and so at that point, we've already checked a lot of boxes for quality. And then consistency becomes a really important factor at this stage. And so consistency in not just the milling, but in the storage and how we manage it um, so that it ends up being consistent for, for you as well. Um, we also get, uh, so you know, we have internally a, a pre-ship and then an arrival. And then we send that to customers as well, like, like we did for you, yep. um, so that you can evaluate that same product after it's landed. Um, the benefit you have, you know, when you work with the same coffee year after year is that you have a basis to work from and that's helpful for you as well yeah. to have consistency. Um, and it's an agricultural product too. So you, you also know that you can sometimes, as much as we strive for consistency, you, you can see some variation and, and that variation usually reflects, uh, differences in, in climate, um, or maybe if there were different decisions made at the farm level on, um, on anything from weeding to fertilizer um, to the level of care and picking and, and depulping, fermenting, drying, et cetera. So yeah, you mentioned fertilizing and, and taking care of the plants and things like that. Obviously that's a big deal. And you know, as a roaster, we get asked so many times about organic coffee and you know, people saying that um, I can't drink it unless it's organic and this and that. And I I, I believe that having an organic coffee is a wonderful thing. You know, nobody wants harmful pesticides uh, in their coffee and things like that. But I also know that a lot of times smaller farms or farms in, in countries where, um, you know, it's just not as accessible to getting that USDA organic sort of stamp that I can put on a bag isn't always, uh, isn't always a possibility. So, um, for instance, how do some of the farms that you guys work with manage uh, the organic issue and uh, making sure that their coffees are as, um, I guess, for lack of a better word, healthy um, or, you know, not using harmful pesticides? And how do you guys manage that and work with farmers to uh, mitigate that? Well, we learned some big lessons with, uh, with Roya, with leaf rust. And so this was, you know, an airborne, um, disease that is something that it attaches to the leaves to the bottom side and it just begins eating at the leaf and so when 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 a tree doesn't have its foliage it can't go through the process of photosynthesis mm -hmm. and so that's i mean at its simplest level um we want we want the trees to be healthy healthy trees can produce better tasting products better tasting coffee, a healthier food. And so because you can't like corn plant and have a, a harvest relatively quick, um, it takes seven years at high elevation where you, from when you plant to get a mature harvest. Um, it, it's very risky to make a short-term decision. Um, so when it comes to organic, uh, we, I never am pushing anyone to, to be fully organic. Uh, we're encouraging people to make the best decisions long-term. And so to do that, you, you really need to take care of the soil. And it's very easy if you push volume to deplete the soil of nutrients. And you can have one or two really good years of quality and quantity, but you can't continue to have both. Mm -hmm. You start to lose one or the other. and so when you have a seven-year cycle, um, you have a very volatile um, output in terms of your quality and quantity if you're, if you're pushing hard. So in order to have good quality consistently, um, you, you need to be really realistic with your qu quantity expectations. Um, so fortunately for us, we, we have a microclimate and an elevation where 
we really we really don't have concerns with 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 pests and outside of roya with diseases um and so uh, almost no one in our area is using any pesticides um uh, herbicides people are are not paying for the chemical to get rid of the weeds they're just using a machete and just swiping it uh uh just horizontal right right along the ground um and you just do that a few times a year at the right point in time um and then the uh the the fertilizer application and that's where people i would say you know where people use chemical uh, in small farms in with the nango it's it's what they can afford with with fertilizers um and so generally with with dep here uh this is where if you really want to push high production and high have high quality you can only do that for a few years before the soil is very depleted um, so whether it's because of affordability or lack of affordability or someone's just making a good long-term plan uh, people aren't pushing um, high uh, production um, it's also very expensive so if you have one year that doesn't go as planned and you really invested and expected high quality and quantity um, but something happens with the weather or there, there, are, there are labor challenges um, you've made a very big investment and and the only return is going to be short term and if that disappears uh, obviously that's a, a very big risk so really taking care of the land is pretty pretty important in this area because the cost of production for us is is higher than it is for most and the risk of investing to produce a lot and not getting that um is 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 a is a pretty big risk that uh, few people can afford to take and the people that can afford to take it see that it it doesn't make sense so all that to say we had our soil tested um five years in a row this was a this was almost 15 years ago and and every year and so our farm is not certified organic um, and we've got a few plots where we've gone all organic and and we've learned a lot there um, but we've taken our soil to be tested and and every year they're saying okay there's there's less traces of chemical in your soil do you use chemicals and you say oh, well we do use these fertilizers um, well it looks like in the results from your soil testing you've you've got less traces of chemical than most organic certified farms like, how's that <laughs> and uh, and for an organic certified farm, you've got a lot of other elements that maybe they're adjacent to another farm that isn't. And, um, and oh, wow. maybe they, they weren't organic a few years ago, um, but they really pushed high volume commercially. And so there's things in the soil that, that stay there for a long time. Yeah. Um, so we, we've been very fortunate that some of our challenges are also strengths in terms of the limitations of production and the cost and difficulty of production. Um, so most most of the coffees in Huehuetenango, um, I, I would say when you compare globally, um, are are using chemical in the context of fertilizers only, but they're not using any pesticides or herbicides or fungicides. And then oh yeah, coming that's where the fungicide opened up, and that that's changed now in Huehuetenango, and you see all kinds of treatment. But ultimately, trying to have a tree is the best way to combat, um, and that just means a lot of constant, constant care. It may mean sometimes weeding two or three times instead of once or twice, and uh, pruning a little bit more frequently, and sometimes a little heavier, which means you're going to reduce your upcoming harvest, but you're going to have a healthier tree, and you're going to have more longevity in that same tree. So um, obviously Roya, you mentioned it's an airborne disease. We have our own little airborne pandemic happening right now, COVID. So anybody watching this in the future, there was a pandemic 2020. Uh, and uh, you know, how has that affected production and farmers and getting people to come and work on the farms and taking those precautions? And then just how have you seen the coffee market uh, change uh, for Onyx, and uh, you know, you know, obviously our business has been affected uh, with you know restaurants being down and cafes, and obviously offices are are closed all across the country. And so, how has that affected you guys? And then, obviously, how does that trickle down to the farmers who have worked, you know, 
to, to produce their, their mm. crop well before COVID even kind of arrived at our shores here. And now they're sort of hit with, oh God, I got all this coffee. How do I sell it? Because it's, like I said, it doesn't get better with age. It doesn't just, you know, it doesn't miraculously disappear either. So, Well, we were very fortunate in that a lot of the most labor intensive portion of, of harvest was wrapping up as COVID was hitting. And so there are other parts of the world that have, have faced since and will face um, challenges that we didn't. Um, as, you, as you know, coffee growing can be very labor intensive and, and where we're at, it's all, it's all hand picked. Yep. Um, it's some of the steepest land in, in Central America. Um, and so our challenges have been more just logistically. Um, the roads are already bad to begin with. Um, so that's an, it's already a challenge to, to move product around. It costs more money for us to get coffee from, from most farms uh, in Huehuetenango to uh, a mill in, in, in or near Guatemala City than it costs to get it from there to the port and anywhere in the world, to, to Sydney, to Tokyo, to New York. Um, so the logistical challenge of, of getting around has always been there. and. With COVID, it added a layer of um, uh, of complexity that didn't stop things; it just slowed things down a little bit. Mm -hmm. um, and I think we were also fairly fortunate there too, um, because the Guatemalan government reacted pretty quickly. And I think there's a certain um, some of this is maybe in the Latin culture a little bit more drama and um, the, you know news spreads, and then with uncertainty. Um, people became very cautious very quickly. And so that really was a good thing to flattening the curve. I was on the last flight, uh, last Delta Airlines flight leaving the country, um, middle of March. And, and, and we stayed in frequent communication as we learned how people were not able to drive from one department to another. We we're thinking, how are we going to move coffee? Well, everyone's facing the same challenges. And so we were just taking it one, one day at a time, one week at a time. And in the end, we, we didn't have any major obstacles in terms of logistics, which was the big concern. Um, but the, the, the concern moving forward right now is, uh, is if it, you know, how safe it will be and if people will feel comfortable and how to manage having, having people picking coffee, which is usually a very, much a group activity and how, how, how we will manage that. Um, so we were able to see uh, in other countries, you know, Colombia has different seasons. So we're able to see how other people roll into this. And most of Central America starts harvest a little bit earlier than Guatemala. So um, we, we also will be able to benefit from, from learning from other people and, um, and observing. But our greatest challenge, I think, uh, the last question you ask is, you know, where do producers sell their coffee? Um, because if demand drops, mm -hmm. uh, where does it go? And which demand specifically is dropping? Um, well, a lot of what a lot of what we do is <laughs> squarely in that space. Uh, roasters that have their own retail locations, roasters that that wholesale other cafes uh, as well as to, to restaurants. And, um, hotels, of course, you know, hotels being shut down, restaurants being closed or at a very low capacity, and um, you know, cafes creatively working to pivot. You know, there's very few cases where cafes are are um, doing better than they were, you know, 12 months ago. Mm -hmm. um, and so, just a, a whole supply chain of, of challenges that came back to the, the window where most people are selling their coffee is really throughout harvest. And so I think the people who maybe have the highest risk or who, who could least afford um, it, an economic hit are also the people that can't afford to sit on their coffee and, and wait for a good price. So they're depending on people uh, paying them and essentially pre-financing their harvest. So the people that I think could have been most hurt by it uh, were actually the most insulated, which is a good thing. Um, 
and, uh, and for the most part, they're also the people that aren't getting a very good price too. Um, so that, that, that is the trade-off when, when someone's getting free financing. Um, so the uncertainty that most of us had, um, they, they didn't experience that as much this last year. And then for midsize and larger farms, um, the bottom line is a lot of people just uh, took a cut um, because it was just better to sell uh, at a lower price and have payment um, yeah. than to end up sitting on it. Yeah. Um, you know, we experienced a lot of a lot of roasters that canceled contracts, which was a very hard thing. Um, and uh, you know, we, I I empathize a lot, but it's also it hurts us, and and th and that that carries back. Um, but we tried to anticipate as much as possible, and to to be responsive in terms of engaging uh, people very quickly, um, and even anticipating. Uh, where we think they might be. If someone's very optimistic, we're excited about that, but we still want to have fluent communication. Um, and for the most part, we found that uh, I think the level of uncertainty is, has, has carried through to the degree that, that most buyers are a lot more conservative uh, today than they were 12 months ago. And, and so that means the conversations that we have are actually healthier and, and more realistic even though there's more uncertainty um, and uh, and that's that's a good thing I think that's a good thing that we need to hang on to uh, even as we work out of this just to be more calibrated and more precise um, in in projections uh, which obviously is much much harder and, and nearly impossible now but uh, that's part of what it defines us having a future as being able to mitigate risks yeah have you, um, you know, with all that's happening now, have you guys seen any maybe, goal, did you see any trends kind of happening or now that COVID's here, or have you seen anything that you think is around that's going to stick around, whether it's a style of service or um, the types of coffee people are interested in or any of that? Have you seen any kind of trends or do you start to see trends uh, that some of your roasting partners are kind of moving towards? Uh, whether it's to also, you know, change up their business and try and find new avenues to sell coffee. Yeah, it, it's been really exciting, I think, to see a lot of the pivots that, that have taken place. And some of them clearly are, are short term. So, for example, and, and some and the ones I think to really lean into are the ones that have some some traction long term. But the short term ones are, you know, when you've got shortages of sugar and flour, um, and milk at the grocery store, but a roaster is also baking and they happen to have wholesale deliveries of flour and sugar and milk. Um, that's been a very successful pivot I've seen a lot of companies make that I think is a short-term pivot because I, I don't see that being the most efficient way for, for people to get their groceries. Mm -hmm. But when people couldn't get their, their basics, their basic bread basket elements, um, to be able to get it at a local coffee shop was a really high value. Um, so I think the concept of just pivoting to, to understand what customers want and need um, is just an important value in general to always be listening because as, as we value quality, we want to pursue something that is excellent and share that. But what do the people that we're selling product to want? And so I think some of the trends that, that will last are, um, <laughs> this pulls away from coffee a little bit, but I think what people are craving most right now is community. Uh, well, people have you know, been in their home, they've not interacted with people, uh, we're afraid to interact too closely with people. Um, and so coffee is a bit of a social lubricant and it, it's provided a lot of community. So I think, what a coffee house can't provide with, you know, the 30 seats that it had now seats 10 or 12. Um, they, they need to find ways to step up and to continue to provide community. So specifically, I think the, the role that the coffee can play with, with consumers um, is anything that builds trust. So the, the character of a company, 
you know, a lot of storytelling. I think, you know, like in your case, just, you know, owning your, your full history, where you're at. Mm -hmm. um, these are things that I think are very compelling. Um, and then in terms of us in our space, where we are as a, a, an exporter, Onyx Coffee Guatemala, and then as an importer, Onyx Coffee, um, we, we've made some changes and we're gonna continue to make some changes. Um, and that is to, to diversify a little bit. Um, I think people we started working with 12, 13, 14 years ago um, have, you know, they, they came in with the idea that we're connecting with these really great micro lots. And we're still continuing to do that. Um, and we want to chase these gems that are maybe really small, really high scoring lots. But we also want to have these really solid base coffees that are still an exceptional coffee, mm -hmm. but are both at a very approachable price all the way through the supply chain so that so that it can it can have a, a broad appeal and still have a really really high quality product so i think that's where El Rey to find it. yeah that's that's exactly what that is really that i think is uh you know the, the lion's share of of when we talk about sustainability and coffee it has to be in that space mm -hmm. it's not it's not in the you know the it's not in the 87, 88 point coffees. It's in the 84 and 80, 84 and a half, 85. Um, that's really where sustainability uh, has an impact because that's where we have a majority of volume that, um, that, that, that meets both the, the, the crossing points of, of quality and sustainability. That's been our kind of focus. You know, I've always seen PATH as a, as a, maybe as a gateway into specialty coffee for some people, but I always had this idea that we wanted to have coffees that were unique, but still very approachable. Mm. We didn't have to mm. have coffees that were way out there, uh, whether it's, let's say, a geisha or some sort of even natural process coffees. You know, we really like those washed coffees, those transparent coffees. Uh, clean, crisp flavor, um, good body, uh, but definitely that unique and approachable concept has really worked well for us and our customers. Because at the end of the day, mm -hmm. you know, if you're a cafe or you're a restaurant, you want to be able to sell as much coffee as possible and have as many positive reactions to that coffee so that you get the return business. And so we, we look at ourselves as yeah. that sort of source of uh, unique but approachable so that there's something there that's exciting that makes you want to go in for that next sip um, over and over and as that coffee cools down it just gets nicer and while you're like really pleasantly surprised that it's not bitter or unpleasant but actually it's tasting really delicious and and so that's where we kind of stand and that's why we love El Regalito because it's a great base coffee it works great in blends it's delicious just as a straight alone single origin brewed up in your V60 or in your batch brewer um, and so that's why we're always so excited to get coffee from you guys and um, specifically uh, from that farm right now. Uh, but, you know, as time goes on, we're always excited to taste those new coffees. So um, that's one of the benefits of having the forward contract is being able to get those samples uh, right from the farm before they've shipped and really kind of get in on the bottom floor to see what is available that harvest, you know, and, and have our pick of the litter, so to speak. Yeah, and that provides really the ability, you know, having your support for us to continue to have a consistent investment in that production, in that quality. Mm -hmm. And and I I think having having something that delivers something delicious to a lot of people um, is undervalued. Nothing wrong with it. If if <laughs> yeah, if we if we we put a lot of focus in specialty coffee on on these really high scoring stars, uh, which I think is good, but it, but we need to have a sense of balance. And when we when we put a lot of attention on that, um, I think I mean even for myself, we we cup a lot of coffee, and uh, and I've I've simplified how I categorize coffees that I like um, into two buckets, and. Some of my favorite coffees are, are coffees that I sip 
Um, and really some of my most, the most exquisite and interesting coffees for me are often going to be an Ethiopian coffee or a Kenyan. And, and I sip them and, and I just absolutely love them. Um, and I treasure them and I, I look forward to it. Um, but then, and this is where I'm obviously very biased. And I think Guatemala produces is very strong at this, at producing what I would call chuggable coffees. Yeah. And it's just something that, you know, that you have a sip and, and pretty quickly you, you want, you want more and you can enjoy it. It's easy to drink. You really like it. And you can be thinking and focusing on it and find nuance, complexity, or you can just not care at all about the coffee and, and you're just having a cup of coffee, but you're still really in, um, it's, it's not a, a painful experience, which a lot of coffee is. And well, a lot of people drink coffee, just have it out of caffeine, out of, it's in the office, uh, I need to wake up. Why do you uh, add milk and sugar want, to something? Yeah. Like, you know, because it doesn't taste good. <laughs> you know, you don't add it to, you know, something that tastes good, you know, if, but these coffees are really nice there. I told somebody, a friend, yes, uh, not yesterday, but like a week ago, you know, these coffees are naturally sweet. And it was almost like a, a revelation, like coffee sweet, you know? Yeah. I mean, they're, it's an agricultural product. It's yeah. part of a cherry. I mean, it should be sweet at the end of the day. Why should it be unpleasant to drink a cup of coffee black? It's just mm -hmm. so crazy to me that people just immediately milk and sugar. And I'm, I'm guilty of certain things. Like, yeah, I like to put salt on things. Sometimes I do it before tasting the food, but at the end of the day, you know, most food, if well seasoned, you don't need to add extra sugar. So these coffees are sort of like well seasoned food. You know I mean? Like they're already got the, the sweetness in it. They've already got the body. We've done our work to find these coffees. You've done your work. The farmer's done their work. Chuggable coffees are also easier to brew. Yes, yes, they are. Yeah. And we've always, we've always tried to focus on that. You know, we want to roast these coffees to make them easy to extract for people. We don't want to make it like, we don't want it to be a complicated endeavor to extract good flavor out of these coffees that we have on our menu specifically El Regalito, mm -hmm. any of the Guatemalan coffees that we've gotten from you. And so, um, so yeah, always excited to have them on your menu and my customers love them. And uh, we hope that anybody watching these videos will try it out and, uh, you know, they'll enjoy them as well, I'm sure. Yeah, thank you. Thank you so much, uh, Jason, for, for, hey, welcome. for your time and your support. Um, I think uh, it really is the, a team effort all throughout the supply chain and uh, just just in our team, I know you were asking about QC and, and Marvin is going to mills for the last three months, even through COVID, taking precautions, going in and out with, with, with a mask. Uh, we work with quite a few dry mills um, and bringing samples back and Jorge is preparing and cupping and sending samples up to us here constantly and sending up cupping notes. Um, and our logistics team, uh, Ilda and, and Loiret are, are working uh, really to make sure we get the, the right coffees in the right box at the right time. And uh, the timeliness is, is a challenge too, so that we're, we're landing them in the right time. Um, and then uh, it's really rewarding to, to see and for us to share as well and be able to, 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 to get some of the finished product and share it with everyone in the supply chain. Um, it's always easy and a joy to showcase, I think, the producer. And we want to always keep doing that. Um, I find a lot of reward in these conversations because I, I, I personally enjoy sharing, like to take a bag of path coffee realito and give it to someone you know, and have Marvin, our mill QC guy say, hey, you know, sh share some of this with, with one of the truck drivers that's moving the coffee for us. Yeah. Because, um, you know, they're, they're actually physically, you know, taking risk and, and, and moving it across country. Um, and they're repeatedly doing that um, in pretty pretty challenging roads. So, um, yeah, thank thank you thank you for uh, for all that you're doing and for uh, for sharing some of this information too. I, I'm excited that I really enjoyed how how clear and articulate you were with presenting uh, really a lot of information in a very clear and simple way in, cool. in uh, your first first few videos. So I, I look forward to you <laughs> doing many it. more. Yeah, I hope so. Uh, well, thank you so much, Edwin. Um, Edwin Martinez from Onyx Coffee. We always appreciate what you guys do. Please send our best to all the farmers that you work with um, and to your team. And uh, 
we look forward to a continued uh, relationship uh, as time goes on. Cool, cool. Thank you, Jason. You're welcome.